Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Most of my work is, is dealing with, with social networks, and in the past, it's, it's dealt with networks at a fairly macro scale uh, with respect to cities, with uh, economic flows and globalization and that sort of thing. And in this talk, I'm, I'm taking a step down in, in scale, thinking about more micro-level networks, and, and I'm going to try and offer at least a preliminary answer to this question, are diverse communities possible? Um, it may sound at first like a fairly grim answer, because the answer I'll give is no, they're not possible. But, but I think there may be a, a sort of a bright side or a way we can put a positive spin on, on this answer that I'll, I'll offer. So I, I enjoyed putting this, this presentation together because I've been thinking about community policy in the United States. And it exists, but it's, it's very fragmented, very piecemeal. And what I find in, in the UK is that community policy, although it's, it's very amorphous, it's very ambiguous, it's articulated in a much clearer sense in, in some of the policy documents that are coming from the government. Uh, much of it starts from, from the Home Office in a, in a report that came out in, in 2001 in this push to, to find a way to enhance community cohesion. They say, we believe there's an urgent need to promote community cohesion, which of course triggered a, a need to figure out what community cohesion was and, and, and sort of where it comes from. And, and this proceeded with the, the creation of the, uh, the Commission on Integration and Cohesion, which again raises another question, what is cohesion? But now we also have to find out what integration is too, because we want both of these. But in, in 2007, this commission concluded that if we take integration and cohesion seriously, we can make an important difference. So clearly, promoting integration and cohesion is somehow very important for communities in the UK and, and the US and elsewhere. And most recently, in, in the, under the rubric of, of the big society, the, the cabinet office has made it very clear that they have an interest in promoting communities, in, as they say, making communities bigger and stronger than ever before. And so what we're seeing in, in this policy discussion, both here and in the United States, is this interest in, in communities, and particularly this interest in, in making them more cohesive, making them stronger. And I think this is the right direction to go, but I think there's, there's a hidden part problem here. There's, there's a policy paradox, uh, is what I'd like to call it. In, in this Commission on Integration, the, it became clear that the current policy is committed to seeing integration and cohesion as somehow linked, as what they say, tightly interlocking concepts. But it's not immediately clear how cohesion and integration uh, are, are interlocking. What do we mean? How are they related? One possibility, and I think this is the direction the policy community would like the world to be, is that more integration leads to more cohesion. We can think of these as sort of the, the red world, if you will, uh, this, this red line. So as integration goes up, cohesion goes up too. So more integrated communities are also more cohesive. But it's also possible that cohesion and integration are interlocking in, in a slightly different way in this sort of blue world, where more integration, more integrated neighborhoods are in fact less cohesive. And this is just the opposite, I think, of, of what the policy community would like the world to look like, uh, but it's also a possible way that these two concepts are connected. So first, a, a couple definitions so that we're clear what we have in mind by integration and cohesion so that we can, we can sort of piece together a, a story about them. So in, in this talk, when, when I talk about integration and uh, segregation. I have in mind in segregated communities, these are simply communities, neighborhoods where similar people live near one another. So in, in these figures, we have some imaginary houses. Uh, they're, they're green and white because those are my school's colors. Uh, but this could represent any, any sort of dimension of, of social distance. It could be race, it could be ethnicity, it could be religion, it could be social class, but some dimension that people vary on. So in segregated communities, similar people live near one another. And this is what the policy community is aiming for, the integrated community, where different sorts of people are more evenly mixed through the neighborhood. So cohesion, I think of as, a, we can think of segregation and integration as a sort of spatial concept. It has to do with where people are located. Fragmentation and cohesion, 
I think of as a more social concept. It has to do with how people interact with one another, how people are related, what their social networks look like. And so we can think of first fragmented communities as places where the people living there have relatively disconnected social networks. So as you can see in, in this very simple uh, social network, we've got me and three friends but my friends don't know one another. It's very distinct, very fragmented. And when we have lots of people that have social networks that look sort of like this, it winds up in the aggregate looking like a, a big sort of messy pile of spaghetti. It's, it's fragmented and, and doesn't, doesn't form a clear pattern. We can contrast this with a cohesive community. So in a cohesive community, people have relatively dense social networks. So the same sort of social network there, me, my three friends, the key difference here is that my three friends are also friends with each other. It's a clustered social network. It forms this, this sort of dense cluster. And if we have that sort of social network, in the aggregate, we see these dense communities, these dense clusters form within the larger neighborhood. And I think, again, this is the sort of network, the sort of social situation that the policy community is aiming to, toward. We want communities that are both cohesive and integrated. So both, uh, both this social phenomenon and the spatial phenomenon on the previous slide. So to really unpack how these social networks work, we have to think about where social networks come from. How is it that people come to get to know one another and come, become friends? And I'd like to talk about two different sort of very fundamental principles of, of network formation, of friendship formation. The first is homophily. It's, it's the very simple notion that birds of a feather flock together. So in, in this example, an academic like myself, far more likely to interact with other academics because you know, it's where I work, they're the people that live in my neighborhood, they're the people I see on a day-to-day -day basis, and much less likely to interact with, say, the Phantom of the Opera. Uh, now, it certainly doesn't mean that it's impossible. It's just far more likely that on a day-to-day -day basis I'll run to another academic than I will into the Phantom of the Opera. And homophily is an interesting feature. So first, it's, it's a nearly universal characteristic. So we, we see this phenomenon of birds of a feather flock together among people, but we also see it among animals. We even see it among cities. Similar cities have more commerce between them than dissimilar cities. We see it among cells and protein interactions. Similar cells, similar protein interactions occur together. So we see this in, in all sorts of different domains. It, it's a sort of phenomenon that can be stronger or weaker. So this could be a very strong tendency that I interact primarily with, with other similar people, or it could be a relatively weak tendency, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. The most important thing about homophily is that homophily does not necessarily arise due to some sort of aversion. It's not that I dislike the Phantom of the Opera, it's just that we run in different social circles, we work in different places, we don't run into one another. and so. It certainly could be due to something like aversion, something like prejudice, but it's also due to, to just simple opportunities to meet one another, to run into one another on a, on a casual basis. So homophily, the, the first sort of major principle that, that guides social network formation. The second is proximity. Uh, the, uh, it's often called the, the first law of geography, the notion that near things are more related than far things. And this works in, for all sorts of things, but it, it certainly works for people too. It's much more likely that I will run into and become friends with someone that lives just down the street from me in East Lansing, Michigan, and far less likely that I will, although you're, I'm sure, wonderful people, far less likely that I'll just casually meet you on the street and we'll become best of friends, not because we don't like one another, but simply because the opportunity doesn't exist to make it happen. And so networks tend to form in geographically proximate areas. The nearer people are, the more likely you are to run into them and to become friends. And again, this is a, a relatively universal characteristic. We see it among people, among animals, uh, in, in all sorts of domains. And it's also a tendency that can be stronger or weaker. So putting these, these ideas of, of integration and cohesion together, what I'm doing in this research is creating some hypothetical communities and asking what the networks might look like in these hypothetical communities. So we've got three different communities here, and they each have a, about a moderate level of, of segregation. So there's, there's some clustering of similar people living near other similar people, but there's also a, a, a bit of mixing. And so we take these, these hypothetical communities and we suppose that people have a moderate preference for becoming friends with similar others. 
and they have a moderate preference for becoming friends with, with those that live nearby. So moderate homophily and moderate proximity. And in these neighborhoods, if those are the principles guiding social network formation, these are the sorts of social networks we might expect to exist in, in these communities. And so we can start to look at the relationship between the, uh, the spatial dimension, segregated versus integrated, and the social dimension, fragmented versus cohesive. And what we see is that when communities are moderately segregated, they're also moderately cohesive. So it doesn't really tell a very clear story until we start to look at other levels of segregation and other levels of cohesion. And so we can, we can create an imaginary neighborhood that's very highly segregated. So in this neighborhood that's very highly segregated, white households live exclusively next to white households, green households live just next to green households. All of the same network formation, so same level of homophily, same level of proximity, but we find that in this neighborhood, the social network that would likely develop is a vastly more cohesive one. And we see this time after time that more segregated communities tend to be more cohesive in their social networks. Now at the opposite end of the spectrum, we can, we can create an imaginary neighborhood that's very highly integrated. So the white households, the green households are completely evenly mixed in this community. And what we see in highly integrated communities is that they're much, much less cohesive. And so we can put these, these two findings together and it looks like we live in, in one of these blue sorts of worlds, that when social networks are guided by homophily and proximity, making communities more integrated makes them less cohesive. And you can see this is a, a bit of a problem for the, the current policy community because the, the current neighborhood policy, community policy in the UK and the US is premised on the fact that we live in, in a red sort of world. We want to live in the sort of world where more integrated communities become more cohesive. But in fact, it seems like we live in this blue sort of world where more integrated communities, in fact, become less cohesive. And this creates problems for actually realizing the, the goals of, of some of these urban policies we have. And so it forces us to ask this, this question, is, is another world possible? Are we stuck in this blue sort of world? Or could we, could we get into this red sort of world, this world where, where more integration and more cohesion can happen simultaneously? Is it possible for communities to be as the commission wants them to be, both integrated and cohesive. And so what we've got, it just takes a minute to orient yourself to what this, this figure is showing us. So along this dimension here, we have worlds where people are more homophilous, and on this side, worlds where people are heterophilous, where they, they actually prefer friends to be different from themselves. And on this axis, we've got worlds where people prefer friends that live nearby, and down here, worlds where people prefer uh, friends that live far away. And so what we see in this, this upper quadrant here is that if, if the tendency for homophily and proximity are strong, or if they're moderate, or even if these tendencies are, are relatively weak, uh, as long as homophily and proximity are, are present, we live in this blue sort of world. Uh, now this is important because, as I said, homophily and proximity are, are nearly universal trends. Uh, we've never observed a human community before that didn't show at least some tendency towards homophily and proximity. And so likely all of the possible worlds we could live in are in that, that upper quadrant and they're all in this sort of blue world. They're all in this, this set of, of possible worlds where more integrated communities are less cohesive. So we can ask, what would it take to become this, this red sort of world where we could have simultaneously cohesive and integrated communities? So one possibility is that we get rid of homophily. One possibility is that it, it ceases to be the case that people are more likely to become friends with those that are similar to themselves. In fact, in these worlds, people are more likely to become friends with dissimilar others. Um, to translate that, it, it essentially means birds of a feather avoid each other. Uh, and I think this is problematic because it, it seems almost ridiculous. It, it's difficult to imagine a world in which you would be more likely to become friends with people that are very different from you than with people that are actually similar. So this is one way to, to live in a red sort of world, but probably not a very likely one. 
So another possibility is a world in which there's no tendency toward proximity. So these are worlds in which people are more likely to become friends with people that live very far away than with people that live next door. They're worlds in which people avoid their neighbors and get to know people that live hundreds, thousands of miles away. So again, potentially a relatively ridiculous sort of transformation, a, a transformation that, that might not be possible, but this is the transformation that would be necessary to live in, in this red sort of world, a world where integrated communities are also cohesive. So I think we can, we can translate a lot of these ideas into two questions. So the, the first question, I think, is, is a relatively easy question. So what we find is that to create a world where communities can be both integrated and cohesive, people must do one of two things. They either avoid birds of a feather, that is, they avoid people that are similar to themselves, or they avoid their neighbors. Uh, either of these transitions would, would allow us to create communities that were both highly integrated and highly cohesive. Uh, but it raises this question, would we want to live in the kind of world where people avoid uh, others that are similar to themselves, you know, coworkers and, and, uh, and the, the like, and in a world where, where people would avoid their neighbors? And it, it seems to me that this is not the sort of world we want to live in. Uh, you know, on top of that, it's not even clear that this is a, a world that we could create. Um, it, it's not clear that, that we could live in communities where we avoid our neighbors and we avoid similar others. And so it pushes us to, to have to ask, and, and I'll conclude, conclude with this question, it pushes us to ask this, this much harder one. When people behave as they usually do, when people behave according to homophily and proximity, that is, when people form friendships with similar others and with nearby others, there seems to be a trade-off between integration and cohesion. As integration goes up, cohesion goes down. As cohesion goes up, integration goes down. And so the policy dialogue towards forming both integrated and cohesive communities uh, may be looking for a potentially unattainable goal it seems that it, it might not be possible to simultaneously create communities that are maximally integrated and also maximally cohesive. It may be the case that the, the right pr uh, policy goal is to try and find a balance. And this balance may differ from community to community. Uh, some communities may develop, uh, may, may benefit from, from more cohesion uh, if, if at the hands of, of somewhat greater spatial segregation. Others uh, may, may benefit from more fragmented social networks, but a highly integrated spatial pattern. Uh, but what this work seems to suggest is that all of the possible worlds we have available to choose from are somewhere on this blue line. And we have to find a, a point of, of balance where we're willing to accept the level of integration and cohesion that, that we can actually achieve. 